Welcome to In the Open with Luke and Joe. I'm your host, Luke Schantz. And here's my co-host, Joe Seppi. And a big welcome to our special guest, Jamie Thomas. Before we get to our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. In this episode of In the Open, we're pleased to bring you a conversation with Jamie Thomas. Jamie is the Open Source Security Foundation Board Chair and General Manager for Systems, Strategy, and Development at IBM. She's a rare talent and an accomplished leader with an expertise in hardware, software, and cybersecurity. Before we welcome Jamie, let's say hello to my co-host, Joe Seppi. Hey, Luke. How are you, my friend? Good. How are you doing, Joe? I'm all right. I'm all right. I was uh, excited about spring coming, and then it dumped a bunch of snow, which was beautiful. And now it's melted. I've got my motorcycle ready. Like I'm spring. I'm I'm really itching for it. It's uh it's a decent day out there today, but spring can't come soon enough. How are things by you? Well, it is it's like 50 degrees out there. It does feel like spring. I just got new all-terrain tires for my pickup truck, so I'm ready for the mud, no problem. But uh, you know, so it's uh <laughs> Yeah, you got a lot of work to do out in the woods and uh, get muddy with your new truck. It sounds great. I do. It's a, uh, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's a uh, fantasy come true. <clears throat> nice. But, but without further ado, let's welcome Jamie, our guest. Hi, Jamie. Hello. Great to see you, Joe and Luke. And thanks for having me in the open today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just chime in on the weather here in Raleigh. I was playing golf last weekend. It was quite warm. And now, of course, I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a sweater. So it's cold again. <laughs> Uh, strange weather we're having this year. Yeah, it really is. It seems like it gets stranger every year. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, there might be something to that. I feel like there's a, a trend there. <laughs> I think so too. So yeah, welcome, Jamie. Thank you for joining. Um, maybe we can start off with a, a little bit of a self-introduction and go from there. Okay, sure. I'm really delighted to be here. I'd have to say, I think I have the most interesting job in IBM, but I'm going to self-declare that. <laughs> Uh, but as you said in your introduction, I started out in, uh, as a software programmer in IBM, spent most of my career in software, and then I moved over to the land of hardware, which of course doesn't run actually without software, so there's a little bit of an entanglement theory there. Uh, but today I manage the advanced uh, processor and systems design from the design to the development to the manufacturing to the shipment. Uh, so I do get involved in the whole life cycle, including the manufacturing and supply chain, which has been pretty exciting in the last few years. Um, along the way, I developed a really keen interest in product innovation, of course, uh, given the kind of teams that I manage and product security. And so about two years ago, I actually assumed the ownership of IBM's enterprise security mission as well. And it was really, I think, founded on my long term involvement in software and uh, hardware product security. Uh, and that office really owns the CISO role. We have a great CISO, Coast Lodgwick, and so I'll give a shout out to Coast. And uh, the team is responsible for cyber operations and product security. That's really fascinating. And those two things really do intertwine, right? The, the hardware, the software, security, like it, it's all interrelated. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had a keen interest in that over my career. Uh, I guess it was when we did WebSphere many years ago that we really conquered this notion of how do you really meld the software with the hardware and create this differentiated value and it's interesting because that's about the same time we actually started doing a lot of our open source work as well. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, we definitely will spend a lot of time talking about uh, security today, but I think it might be cool to dig into some of your open source background. I know, you know, you, you said you started out programming and stuff and, and you've mentioned Eclipse. Tell, tell us about your open source story. Well, I, my first uh, involvement in open source was probably with the Apache web server work that we did. And that was a early work that we did in WebSphere when we decided we wanted to do take an open source approach to that endeavor as opposed to a IBM proprietary approach. Uh, so we we started on that. We, we did a lot of obviously we learned a lot from that effort. And our next big effort that I was involved in was the, the Eclipse Foundation which is where we took a lot of our intellectual property around the tool chain, uh, particularly for Java, and we spun that in, out into the Eclipse Foundation. Um, I ended up managing uh, what was then the Rational organization. We had acquired Rational, and they were very key in the uh, construction of a lot of the concepts and methodology that went behind this. But the important thing was we really, we really were intent on creating an open ecosystem for Java programmers. 
and we we did feel that this endeavor was was successful in allowing more Java programmers to participate in an ecosystem that added value as well as work with IBM on the the work that we did after that. Um, I guess the next big thing we did is we IBM invested quite a bit in Linux, um, and uh, I was um, actually still in WebSphere a lot of the during when that first started. Uh, but one of the fundamental things we realized is that Linux did need to be a cross-platform play. And so we invested to make sure that Linux was a first-class citizen with our hardware platforms, particularly our Z franchise. And of course, that's been uh, beneficial to this day. Um, I guess the culmination of that whole story is the acquisition of Red Hat, which was quite a big uh, deal. And I, I was really pleased to see the Red Hat team uh, join IBM. It was really a culmination in, in this long-term uh, effort around Linux. But in between that, of course, I've seen many, many different uh, open source projects. But historically, those are the three that I think really pivoted IBM into this direction. Yeah, I mean, those three are huge. And and I think, you know, often, oftentimes people don't realize, and I, I take every opportunity to, to share with them, like IBM's long, rich uh, history in open source. In fact, there's a, a link here that you can read more about this. Uh, Luke and I were just recording a video last week, uh, kind of going through that story but those three things alone uh apache uh eclipse linux foundation i mean those are huge players in the open source space and you know we were uh, integral in, in spinning them up and, and getting them going and um and i think too the important thing that i think you're touching on there as well is is the whole concept of open governance mm -hmm. you know, and having everybody participate equally and having no one have you know outsized influence in the development of these uh uh, you know, the software and, and these foundations and, um, you know, uh, IBM has been key to that work in a, in a variety of ways. It's really, I love sharing that story whenever I can. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, where, where, where do you want to go now, Luke? Where should we dig into? So, well, I feel like maybe we should defer to Jamie, but my, my, uh, inclination would be, let's talk about uh, what the landscape's like, and you know, because security is such a big deal, and we're talking about open source, let's talk about the uh, the Open Source Security Foundation and your work there, and sort of give us a, a, a the layout of that landscape. Okay, well, I got involved in the Open Source Security Foundation late last year because the foundation itself recreated itself, right? It it created a new uh, governing body, if you will, of senior executives across the many firms that are participating. And the, the aim of the, 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 the core objective was to ensure that open source is secure for all of those downstream consumers because the world depends on it. Um, and uh, we set forth a charter, uh, some basic concepts of what we wanted to achieve. Uh, and interesting enough, uh, it wasn't long after that that Log4J occurred. Uh, so Log4J, of course, was a large security event affecting one of the most commonly used open source uh, modules in the industry. Uh, and it, it did uh, suffer from a, a critical vulnerability, of course, but the, the amount of use of Log4J is really what struck the industry at large because everyone had to understand where it was, how to patch it from a delivered software perspective, as well as for any, anything that resided on infrastructure within an organization that would include cloud services or internal infrastructure, et cetera. So it was different in terms of what had already occurred from a, cyber perspective in the industry. And I think this then only reinforced the fundamental principles that OpenSSF had already embraced and had started to embark on, right? But it did it in a big, big splash. Uh, you can't imagine the concern that occurred from the world at large, uh, from you know financial institutions to healthcare organizations, to critical infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, because Log4J was so highly uh, prevalent in, in um, our our code. So uh, it was a real test of everyone's ability to patch expediently, to also execute cyber operations. Uh, it did solicit a lot of governmental uh, attention. Uh, so you can see out there that the White House did convene a meeting around Log4J and what we needed to do to further protect ourselves. I attended along many of the, with many of the other members actually that are on the open SSF. You can see out there in the White House press articles who attended uh, including the open, um, the open SSF team, the Apache Foundation, etc. So it was a, it's a good collaboration because it's going, it will require industry collaboration in my mind to really conquer this kind of problem. 
and to make sure that we can uh, be the adults in the room, if you will, to provide the insight, the skills, the best practices, and the oversight recommendations that allows open source to be effective going forward. Now, one of the key points that we did make uh, is that this notion of curated open source, which we are really big sponsors of, is absolutely critical in this journey. Uh, Red Hat is a great example, if you will, of curated open source. Uh, when we're consuming open source from an organization like that, they have developed the uh, uh, approach, the, the, the acumen, if you will, to be responsible for a lot of these different aspects of open source delivery into enterprise organizations. Uh, we at IBM, obviously, we're taking advantage of Red Hat ourselves on a big scale. And of course, uh, that's one of the interests we had in Red Hat in terms of enabling that capability for the rest of the world. But I think it's going to be a double-edged sword working with the curation aspect of what a firm like Red Hat can do. And also, of course, making sure that the, the new open source endeavors um, start secure uh, from day one, right? And that they have the ability to stay secure going forward. Yeah, <clears throat> there's there's so much to dig into in, into what you just said there. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting, like, you know, it's easy to say, like with Red Hat and OpenShift, you know, like enterprise ready and battle tested and all those sorts of things. But this is where it really, really means something um, in terms of being secure and curated open source. But I wanted to touch on, um, you know, you were talking about uh, Log4j and how OpenSSF sort of uh, re uh, restarted itself. Um, maybe you could touch on the the, the thought of, um, you know, th these sorts of things happen and everybody focuses attention on them and then they sort of fade out. And then what happens, well, you know, where the OpenSSF can kind of come in and help uh, uh, keep our attention on these things. Right. I mean, I think that's a really important point because, um, you know, in December there was Log4j and then not too long ago, unfortunately, there was the Russian invasion, which is also another flavor of a uh, cyber concern, if you will, right? So these things are never ending. And we uh, we have to make sure that we have a systemic focus on improving uh, what, what needs to be improved, regardless of the latest event du jour, if you will, right? And I think that's really the important endeavor of, of the OpenSSF, is making sure that we have uh, put in a systemic framework for education and skills, a systemic framework for identifying the most important projects and making sure that they have the tools, the best practices and approaches to ensure security, uh, despite who the contributors might be over a period of time, um, and deploying all the techniques we can, right, to ensure systemic runs along with what I describe is uh, the, ever, the never ending opportunistic landscape of cyber. Um, and so open SSF is a, a critical to this. Uh, in IBM, we also have uh, a very uh, honed approach, if you will, for our own systemic operations. But also we have uh, upped our contribution, if you will, to this kind of endeavor with OpenSSF to make sure that we are there and where our opinion is rendered along with the other key players in the industry that are participating. And there's, you know, the, the players are out there for everyone to see, but it's, it's Microsoft and Google and AWS and Meta, some of the financial organizations, GitHub. Um, so it's a very important set of players, I think, that are participating and working together. Go ahead, Luke. Well, I was going to ask, uh, Jamie, so we hear a lot uh, lately about software bill of materials. I'm wondering how that fits into the the play here, because I'm imagining when we're talking about opinionated stack with, you know, Red Hat, you know, in a way, obviously, that's what they're doing, right? They're they're really mm -hmm. looking at what's in there and making choices and, and, and hardening that. But how it is the software bill of materials play into the, the ecosystem and what everybody else is going to need to do? Well, I would say that there's probably many, many different opinions as to what the software bill of materials should actually um, contribute over the longer term, right? And perhaps, perhaps that it, it really has too many roles and definitions if you think about it. But to me, in the world of software delivery, the most important thing is you understand uh, the origin of your software that you understand for every discrete um, service that you're building or for a package set of software, you understand the DNA of that software. And the DNA is really represented by the software bill of materials. So there's been a lot of discussion about revealing the software bill of materials to 
organizations. There have been some discussion, discussions in the executive White House orders as to how we would use the software bill of materials. From my perspective, we need to use it to have fidelity of operations around software delivery, understand whether that's that uh, these software projects that we're consuming are mature, that they're secure. In other words, um, my advice would be consuming software that's only controlled by a few contributors is risky, right? It's not it's not that it might not be good, be good software, but you have to look at your risk mitigation. So to me, the SBOM is going to give us that insight over time. I had uh, rendered my opinion that I don't think SBOM should be made public. And when you think about that, if you think about it from the context of an organization like IBM, why would I necessarily share, for instance, where log4j resides ahead of having a patch for log4j. Uh, it just, it almost says, you know, there's an opportunity here to come attack this particular asset or whatever, right? So I don't know that there's value in having public SBOMs. I think there's value in using the SBOM information intelligently and to the um, benefits of improved software quality, security, uh, and delivery to all the consumers that are using it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And you've mentioned that the White House meetings a, a couple of times, and that's actually <clears throat> how, um, you know, I, I thought like to, uh, to mention to Luke that we should reach out to you because um, I work with the LF people often uh, at the OpenJS Foundation and whatnot, and they mentioned uh, you being at the the meetings and how great you did. And I was like, oh, we got to talk to Jamie. But um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the meetings in general, but also in, in, in some of our previous conversations, you had talked about the sort of two sides of this sort of security uh, issue. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this right, but like cyber and vulnerabilities perhaps, or how, how would you phrase that? Well, I, I see that there's two interrelated topics if you're managing security for an organization like an IBM in particular, right? Because not everybody's quite like IBM in that we're delivering a lot of software to clients. But in our world, cyber operations is job number one, right? You have to have the you have to have an inherent ability to protect yourself from the hackers, the bad guys, whatever is happening. You have to have an ability to protect yourself from bad decisions that unfortunately developers make every day. Um, and we can we can assert best practices, but not everybody's going to follow the best practices. A lot of it has to do with training and knowledge. So in IBM, we build a very automated cyber operations capability that is very, very layered. And we're able to, you know, handle a large number of events on a daily basis and, and, and intelligently do something with those events. And the goal is to implement zero trust cyber operations where we assume that people will make mistakes and that, you know, the bad the bad actors will take advantage of those mistakes. Right. Uh, and that's the uh, principles of how we want run cyber operations. But if you think about it, when you're in a system like this, uh, we, we're a, a company full of innovators. And so our other job is to make sure the innovators understand how they design secure software from day one. And we have a policy called secure by design. That's part of our formal IT security policy that all, all of our teams are expected to follow. You know, it's a series of best practices, CICD framework recommendations, and outcomes that we expect these teams to achieve, regardless of their running, developing a product that runs on premise or whether they're developing a product that's going to run in the cloud. Uh, so they all are expected to adopt these. One of the observations that I would have, and, and we do the same thing for hardware security. I was very much involved in Spectre Meltdown, which was one of the bigger events we saw in hardware security a few years ago. Um, and, you know, you have the same uh, objectives there, albeit a little bit different in terms of how hardware comes to life, if you will, as opposed to to the software. Software is a lot more fluid, a lot more dynamic. But one of the observations I have is that we need a further state of the art development, I think, around CICD pipelines where they're not only automated, but they're also, um, you know, there's this element of similar to what we see in cyber. If someone does something wrong on their iPhone or their laptop, I get a flag in cyber operations that they downloaded something that's not allowed. So while I've got guidelines, I've also got insight into what they're doing, right? And so I think we need to have CICDs that have a lot more insight 
uh, that are able to flag things that are perhaps of concern that we go out and we address. And it's not just the, you know, we have this with code scanning, but we need something I think more intelligent than even code scanning, because that's what really is helping us in cyber operations, right? We can have the rules, we can have the impediments, but if someone does do something, if they go out to a website that is hostile, uh, you know, we're immediately notified and we can actually shut down the device or, 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 or certainly take other actions. Right. So I, I think there's like maybe a really big opportunity here uh, in this uh, evolution of these CICD tools and everything to, to have something much more sophisticated. Yeah, that's fascinating because we we um, on the show, but also, you know, in, in the work that I do um, uh, day to day are talking a lot about AI ops. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, a lot of the times we're thinking about like, you know, uh, uh, bugs or, or logs and, and analyzing performance and, and all those kinds of things. But but um, it's interesting to think about that uh, applying to security. Right. And it's not to penalize users, it's really to alert users. So for instance, during the pandemic, we had a lot of individuals, they're all working from home. And we saw instances where, where individuals were downloading education software that they were trying to help their child with, but the software had these vulnerabilities that were not acceptable to us. So then we were able to go out and tell them, you know, be careful or we're going to, well, but basically we would rebuild those machines, frankly. Right. Uh, but it, you know, not everyone can be a cyber expert, right? I mean, that's why you have cyber experts that are paid a lot of money. And, and likewise, not everyone's going to be an expert on some of the things that are, uh, really bad programming, um, practices versus good. Uh, and certainly everyone's at a different evolution in their training. So I, I think this is going to be interesting is can we have AI for the CICD have a lot more intelligence that we can then alert organizations so that they can help the individuals be more productive. What, what comes to mind when I'm hearing this too is the enterprise perspective. And I think it it's neat actually to, to look at IBM because this is really where we shine, right? Because with hybrid cloud and, and the modern, you know, the way modern applications for enterprise are built, they're spanning on-prem, different mm -hmm. clouds, maybe like legacy co-located stuff. It, it, mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, App, so it's like a huge attack surface and yeah. so many plates to spin. So I guess my question, I don't know if I have a question there exactly, but I, I guess comment on that. Like, what is the modern enterprise? You know, I, ma I imagine it's a huge attack surface, right? And like, yeah. and, and there's these popular things, like whether it's Heartbleed or Spectre or Log4j um, that, that capture people's attention, but all those other things are still there all the time. And those plates have to be kept spinning, even if they're sort of not in the, the zeitgeist. Well, you know, Luke, you really bring up a really important point. What I've always told our clients historically when outsourcing became popular, that just because you outsource something doesn't mean you don't own it. So you better have um, an SLA, you better have a handshake and agreed upon set of metrics with your outsourcer that says, you know, here's how we're going to work together. The clouds, is, the clouds are no different. They're a different form of outsourcing. Uh, in my view, right, you have outsourced something to someone else. Now, it depends on how you're using the cloud. They may own an entire application for you. You could be in a Salesforce type situation, which IBM's a very, very large user of Salesforce as an example, right? Or you could be in a, in a case where you're just renting infrastructure and you're responsible for the application on top of that infrastructure. But at any rate, you have to have a clear SLA policy and agreement with your outsourcer. I mean, it's a different form of outsourcing in my mind. Uh, one of the key things, though, is that not every organization keenly understands who's responsible for security in these kind of paradigms. And uh, the owning organization is ultimately responsible for security. So once again, you have to have the right policy in terms of how you're using these clouds. What we have to do is we have to, as a multi-cloud vendor ourselves, we have to either have a really... Um, clear agreement with the vendor uh, as to what they're doing for us and are many case, cases where we're running assets out on other clouds like um, Amazon or Azure or who, whatever it may be, we do have um, endpoint monitoring on those clouds as well. So we have observability as to what's happening out there. I mean, one of the things you see when any of these vulnerabilities come to light, whether it's, you know, solar winds or whether it's law for j the first players at the table are the Bitcoin miners. 
And, you know, I, I just think Bitcoin miners are kind of, I don't know, in the in the scheme of what can be done, they're a little bit harmless and they're just trying to take over the capacity to find the bit, Bitcoins, but it becomes disruptive, right? But those will be the first actors that show up and you have to have the ability to detect that because the next, the next set of actors are the ones that really have um, much more malicious intent typically. So I, I think that if you're a organization who has a multi-cloud environment, the buck stops with you. You're responsible for your security. And you need to assume that that is the case. You need to assume that you have the right um, uh, vendors that can help you with that model because it does come up, it does become much more complex. In every one of these situations I've seen, it is natural to see that the cloud environments are the first that can get attacked first because they're more exposed. Something that's behind multiple layers of protection, firewalls, et cetera, can be attacked for sure. Uh, but it's going to be a little bit harder, right? You see what I mean? So in this hybrid environment, you've got to be really astute to that. You've got to be astute to who controls your applications, who works on your applications. You know, one of the things I think, unfortunately, that this whole um, terrible situation that we're seeing on television every night with Russia and Ukraine is brought to light is you know, your location strategy for where are your, your, your apps being developed in a cloud environment. There's a, there's a great product productivity coming out of these environments. So I'm not saying that there's no productivity here. There's tremendous productivity, but who is doing things is sometimes a lot more obscure uh, to you, you know, to who actually is the administrator, who actually uh, is developing your, your application, who's securing your application if it's an application that you're purchasing. Um, these things uh, become, they're very important, but they become a little bit more difficult to trace without this, once again, this close SLA policy with your provider, uh, this uh, understanding that ultimately you own it. It's just like I always tell the developers, if you ship open source, it's your, it's your product. I mean, you can point to other projects and everything, but at the end of the day, it's your product. It's your offering, your service that's consuming that. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's a, a good segue. I mean, I, I I kept thinking as you were talking, like the cloud is really just someone else's computer, but uh, <laughs> you're uh, you're responsible for that as, as a, a consumer, you know, as, as taking advantage of that. But you you mentioned about open source and, and, and shipping open source. And I wonder... Um, you know, we had talked about the top 500 projects uh, coming out of a Harvard study and the work that uh, uh, is going on at OpenSSF to uh, identify top projects to be focused on. Um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, we did get a readout uh, most recently from the uh, last uh, Harvard study, the most uh, utilized and important projects. And we have to take that data and understand how we help the top projects become more mature should they need the help. So there'll have to be an assessment done of the top projects to understand uh, the contributor map, um, the kind of tools they're using, the kind of challenges that they have and how we can accelerate their maturity if needed. Some projects will likely be fine uh, for a different set of reasons. And um, one of the things that I'm doing, of course, is matching our most used assets inside of IBM to those projects to understand that map because there can definitely be a difference between the most used and where people are currently contributing. And it's just natural because open source has been around for a while now. So there's a maturity map of open source, just like you would see with any software, uh, right? So you have to look at both dimensions of both strategic evolution of what you need to do to drive your business forward, as well as, you know, what you're consuming. Um, that was one of the you know, that was one of the things that came to light with Log4j because I think it's been around for like 21 years. So it's had plenty of time to proliferate. It's not that it's particularly, you know, I've, I work on quantum computing a bit with the team in IBM. It's not like quantum computing. It's not quite that complicated in terms of the module and what it does, but very important, uh, right, in terms of how it's used and, and, and how widely it was used. So that's a little bit about what the OpenSSF hopes to achieve with that analysis of the, the top projects. Yeah, it's interesting too. I, I, you know, I work in the Node.js space and and with the OpenJS Foundation and and um, t 
tangentially with OpenSSF and such. And um, this Alpha Omega initiative is really mm -hmm. interesting, um, and that we're you know looking to take advantage of at Node.js. We, I think we have a proposal in that um, <clears throat> you know I can't share any details yet until it's all public. But I'm excited at the aspect of uh, being able to work with with uh, uh, OpenSSF and and try to. Um, you know, make positive changes for those. Yeah. Aspects. yeah. And those I think are important projects kind of looking at this problem from different angles, you know, one focusing on, on a more broad application of how we can impact the projects and another on a more focused application for those projects that might be deemed uh, the most important. Uh, but um, yeah, those are just examples I think of where the, the foundation is really starting to get a toehold, if you will, of what can really be done. I think it's going to be important for us uh, to take practical steps that uh, make a, an impact, right? Uh, and that's going to be one of the challenges because there's so many things we could go do. We're going to have to make sure that we select the the projects that can have the most impact in the shortest amount of time. I, I have a two-part question, Jamie. So the first part is when we were talking with uh, Brian Bellendorf recently, he did mention uh, these initiatives and he didn't give us an exact number, but he mentioned that you know, if, if there was an effort to harden these top projects, it would cost, you know, maybe some tens of millions of dollars to harden mm -hmm. the top projects and, and help them get to that point, which seems like a lot of money. But when you compare it to the numbers you hear of the losses through hacks and, and, and mm -hmm. different things mm -hmm. that are going on, it's, it's really not a lot of money. Um, so my two part question is, you know, when you're talking with companies out there, you know, clients, other, you know, your peers, uh, you know, I have this impression that businesses are reluctant to invest in security because they don't see a direct ROI. Uh, so first question is, do you see that changing because of the public nature of all these hacks that are happening, like Colonial Pipeline comes to mind? And and so is there a, a mindset where folks are more willing to invest in security? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is about what we were talking about, about this supply chain. It's like, you often hear that companies are using open source, but not necessarily putting that effort in to contribute to it. So they haven't maybe jumped that hurdle. Do we see them putting this effort in to help secure open source as well? Because, you know, one of the things I, I've, I've heard, I know I'm, I'm going a little bit long on my question. I'll, re, I'll restate it if need be. Um, but I, I hear about, mm -hmm. you know, once there is a, a, a disclosure of, of a hack, it's not like problem solved. It's like not everybody's patched it. There's like, you know, high levels, like 40% of computers still aren't patched after there was an announcement. And then that's when all of the vultures come in, like you're saying, the <laughs> Bitcoin miner, you know, so maybe nation states had those zero day vulnerabilities or some kind of criminal organization. But then all of a sudden it gets announced. And now the vultures come in and start scanning ports and looking for places to, to you know, to go for people who don't have a, a real plan in place. So I guess uh, I'll stop there. Well, that, that you did have about five questions there, so I'm going to try to remember them all. If I miss one, you can, you can come back to me, Luke. Let's start with the average client. You know, you mentioned Colonial Pipeline, because not every organization is like IBM and has, you know, thousands of developers who can go be in open source contributors and everything. They're just consumers of software that the rest of us produce, right? What those organizations, I think, really need to think about is making sure that their software is up to date. And this is a very hard task. Because I can tell you, I see a lot of evidence of organizations that are running on out of support software. Out of support software is going to have underneath it, out of support open source. Uh, it's going to have vulnerabilities that are not patched because those vulnerabilities are being patched in the latest software. That has been a very large misunderstood topic. And so I think, unfortunately, these bad events are starting to educate a lot of organizations that this this out of support software is not a good thing. Uh, you're going to have to be, uh, you're going to have to keep your software up to date. You're going to have to move to later releases. And we as software providers have got to understand that we got to help organizations be able to do that, right? They've got to be able to do that in a way that allows their business to run. And in other words, if we're shipping software that, you know, is on premise, obviously every you're, you're making a big change every week and it's not going to be easily consumed. And so we've all got to make it easier for the clients to adopt the latest software patches because that's imperative, right? It's imperative that they do that. When something happens, a lot of the organizations don't, they don't easily have the ability to understand what's affected. 
and what's affected even in their infrastructure. So that's another skill that has to be built. If you're managing a big set of infrastructure, you, you need to be able to assess where Log4j is and where it's patched. I mean, we in IBM can do that. But we have a huge amount of infrastructure. It's not just infrastructure for a CIO. It's infrastructure for all the development laboratories and everything else we're doing that have to be patched. My, my, my belief is that even with patching, the best practice for an organization having to patch a lot of servers in that case is a centralized patching team. Because I've never believed that assuming people are going to do this at midnight in their spare time is a good strategy. And in fact, I've actually never seen it work too well. And I've seen, you know, every time you centralize things in a, co a company, people say, oh, it's too expensive. Get rid of it. Decentralize it. You know, tell people to go do it in their spare time. Patching in spare time and assuming people are going to get all that right, I think can be a very dangerous strategy. So my take is you get a, a small team that's effective. You get your, you know, you get that in order. That's what a lot of these organizations need as well. Now, for those of us that have the benefit of having thousands of really skilled developers, it, I think it is our obligation to be participating in the right way. And that's why organizations like Apache and OpenSSF and the Linux Foundation are so important. It's why leveraging um, what we could do through Red Hat is so important, right? It's our obligation to make sure we're taking those actions to help the other organizations who are not software development organizations. They are consumers of software. Now, some of those organizations are so large in the case of some of the, you know, if you look at financial services, they do have thousands of, of programmers. So they are able to also bring to bear contributors. There are companies that are of that size um, that can bring to bear those best practices and participate in these organizations as well. But you look at a lot of the organizations that get taken for ransomware, hospitals, educational concerns, city governments, um, you know, they're not they're not out there able to pay, you know, for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for cyber experts. So we have to help them with some of these basic best practices, which is run up to date software that doesn't have vulnerabilities, have some investment in that you know, have some basic cyber uh, protection, make sure you have a way to get your servers patched in a meaningful time. Um, those are kind of the things we have to help them with, along with the things we're doing to make the, the software inherently more secure, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And it, it, when you're saying that, it reminds me, I was recently listening to a, a podcast about a school district hack. And it, the situation was, you know, they had automated some sort of disaster recovery backup system, but they hadn't checked it. It wasn't working and they they were really stuck then. And the other thing is, and this is uh, to comment on your mentioning, maybe it's not a good idea to have public, uh, you know, um, software bill of materials. Something that they pointed out is the reason that a lot of these hospitals and school districts and governments and stuff are getting hacked is they publicly have to publish their finances. So these these hacking groups know exactly what they're like. They know, you know, what they have and say, hey, we know yeah. you can pay this because you've published it. And I'm, I'm wow. imagining a scenario like that, too, where if, if you have, you know, if you're too public about, you know, what your stack is like and, and what's in your thing, you're also kind of giving a roadmap. If, if there are those organizations that have zero days and things that aren't not known, they, yeah. they, they know where to get you now. Well, I, I think that that is really a, an important question. So deciding what you're going to publish and where you, where you publish it is important, whether it's software bill of materials. You know, I certainly wouldn't go out and publish the bill of, bill of materials for the quantum computer. <laughs> it would be quite a, an interesting thing for a lot of people, right? Uh, but, you know, publishing, you have to be astute about the information that you publish. But what I would say about a lot of those organizations, you hit on a key point, is the data protection is not where it needs to be. So aside from all these other things, it's your, your most critical asset is likely your data. And if you lose access to your, da your, to your data through ransomware, obviously you cannot do anything. And from my experience, most ransomware attacks take at least seven days to recover from. So I personally went out and got gasoline in my car when I saw the Colonial Pipeline attack. Like I think I was out that day because I actually almost ran out of gas the last time the, the pipeline went down to a due to a hurricane here in Raleigh. So I was like, I'm not going to go at, be at a gas line with 100 other people again 
I'm going to have my gasoline because my, my best guess is it'll take over seven days for this thing to come back, which is, I think it took about seven days, right? Um, what organizations need to do is what you said they don't do, which is they need to make sure they have a copy of their data. They need to make sure it's up to date and they need to make sure that it can actually come back to them in their lifetime. The amount of data that gets stored is so vast that it can often take days for the data to come back. So do you have a way that you can get the data back more quickly? And that's why in IBM, we have invested in our storage products uh, capability. It's called Safeguard Copy, which takes snapshots of this data, which is immutable, it's tamper proof, and they can get it back quickly. Now you can then store a lifetime of data, you know, petabytes out on wherever you want to store it, you know, data storage, tape, et cetera, because a lot of organizations have to keep it around for a long time. But you have to realize the amount of time it can take for huge amounts of data to come back. That's your only only option is often days. And that's that's not well understood by a lot of the teams. Right. So you got to protect yourself from ransomware, but you also have to have that data recovery strategy. And the two of them not being done is is often the case. Right. Protection's not there and of, of the basic cyber protection is not there. And then the data protection strategy is not there. And often, and I'll just, another tip, do not put the copy of your data on one device. So don't have your production data on the same storage device as your backup of your data. That's a common thing that happens too. And so if that one device goes down, guess what? It's all on the one device. So you've got to, you got to think disaster recovery in these scenarios and, and um, think about, those types of things. And I find that the smaller organizations are struggling to think about those kinds of things, particularly in this job market, hiring the right kind of skills is very, very difficult. So, you know, we as vendors and we as experts have got to provide the techniques, the best advice, the products that allow people to have more flexibility in an affordable manner to do some of these things. Um, but I've been, you know, for a long time now talking about up-to-date software, I've been talking about supply chain disruption. I've been concerned about supply chain, um, the reality of our supply chains. But, you know, all of this came to reality here in the last few years with COVID-19. We saw an increase in, you know, ransomware and hacking. We've seen an, a, an extraordinary, extraordinary disruption of our supply chains. And uh, that is another, you know, that's another case in point of disaster recovery. Do you know where things are coming from? Do you know what the cause and effect is? Should one country get shut down or should the shipping lanes get shut down or should uh, air flights be dramatically reduced? You know, these are all kinds of things that many organizations have taken for granted, right? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm, one thing that's come to mind, I think you've touched on on some aspects of it, but I know you know, with the Log4J situation, uh, we were able to at IBM kind of figure out uh, uh, where we're using it and, and get patches out uh, for, for our own stuff. Do you, do you have any more suggestions? I think you've kind of touched on some of them, but in terms of like companies dealing with something like that, uh, we talked about like a central uh, organization for patching, uh, making sure you're up to date. Are there any other things that you think people would uh, benefit from, from our experience? Well, obviously, um, you know, we had to, we had to do a number of things. We had to track the the efficiency and the uh, completion of all the product updates. So uh, we we had to do that. We had a central team that you know has tracked the implementation of the servers, the remediation of all the server infrastructure, which is quite vast across the company. Uh, one of the decisions we made early on is if we didn't think it was mission critical and we couldn't patch it, we actually shut them down. Now we had that, we had that ability to do that in some of the uh, development lab capacity, R and D capacity. So it happened over the Christmas holidays, if you recall. So we didn't make some calls that listen, everybody's out for the holidays. We're just shutting down a bunch of this stuff. Right. Uh, we, uh, we also shut down some cloud operations of different software packages that we saw vulnerabilities released uh, or we were aware. So we, we might've shut that down for a day until we could get it patched. So it was both, it was kind of a triage operation, but you have to have the backbone of systematic execution. So do you have the, do you have a team that's going to 
monitor and make sure everything is patched? Do you have a team that's going to make sure you get all the patches from the vendors? And once you get the patches, are you getting those patches deployed? Because I know that a lot of the patches we produced are not deployed across all the clients yet. I mean, there's some of them I'm tracking very closely and uh, I can see that they're not yet deployed. So that's another challenge in this whole thing is that, you know, when something's that prevalent, it's going to take you a while to get those patches rolled out and you have to have someone that's on point to make sure that happens. And it, it has to happen in the, in a time that is effective for your risk management assessment. So parts of your infrastructure may be deemed more risky than others. And so that's part of your judgment, right? In terms of how you roll out that patching. I did have someone tell me not long ago that they had a vendor that was providing the patch in the fourth quarter of this year. Now that is a little bit late for the patch. <laughs> so I, I told them that, you know, I think they need to go back to that vendor and have a, a different conversation. Right. So realize though, that this was very complex for a lot of organizations to manage. And I think we've all learned from, uh, you know, how would we do, what, what would you do different from a communications perspective? Uh, what would you fine tune? How do you increase the velocity? All of those kind of things. Yeah, and I think with a lot of these things, people tend to be reactive. Um, but I think as we kind of, you know, with Log4J and these other big ones sort of happening uh, recently, uh, the shift to being proactive is is really key. And I think that's underpins a lot of what you're saying. Um, I, I wonder, and this is maybe getting back to one of Luke's uh, earlier comments, do you see... Um, <clears throat> In terms of companies that are able to invest in open source, do you see that happening more? And also, and, and I mean that in terms of money as well as resources and involvement, like at OpenSSF and, and such. Uh, and I and I wonder not just companies, but you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about the White House meetings and and was that uh, or was it a two way conversation? Should we expect more from the government? What are you know what's what's going on there? Well, I think that um, I think that I see more large organizations thinking intently about their open source strategy, about uh, participating in these kind of forums if they can, about contributing. In the case of OpenSSF, the core members have contributed uh, some investment there for the ongoing efforts. Um, I see organizations uh, much more thoroughly using scanning tools <laughs> to scan the open is to scan their code for vulnerabilities. So I think we're going to see a lot of the regulated industry be a lot more assertive about what they expect uh, from their um, providers. Uh, we're seeing that because the 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 awareness has been dramatically increased, uh, and part of that is due, of course, to all the executive orders that have come out from the White House around what organizations should be doing and what they are expected to do by the government, which has been, you know, changing over the course of the last year. You know, I, I found that, um, you know, this particular meeting we had was a very collaborative meeting. Um, very good job by Ann Newberger, the um, associate uh, assistant director of national security, who you may have read about in the uh, press recently, uh, also helping the Ukraine, according to the, the press. Uh, but I thought that, um, you know, it was a great forum for us to be able to share across the large organizations about certain topics and share what could work and what we, we thought we think could be most beneficial. And I think that kind of collaboration across the major players will be important going forward. And so we at IBM certainly look, look forward to working in that vein uh, in a collaborative way to understand what will make the biggest difference. Um, Shortly after that meeting, unfortunately, you know, the last few weeks, this these whole events did did play out of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and you can see there where cyber attacks have been a part of the warfare, right? Um, kind of going both ways between the two countries. But certainly there was a big attack on the infrastructure of Ukraine from what we can read about in the press. Um so it, it's just an indication of what, you know, we all suspected that, you know, a battle doesn't take place just with um, the traditional warfare, right? Um, it can, you know, it can be exacted in this vein, and that's why it's so important for us all to be vigilant about it. And that was obviously part of the messages that have been coming out from the administration and the White House over the last year. Uh, the heightened awareness started with solar winds, if you all recover, uh, recall, recall rather, 
And that happened at the end of, of, of 2020. It happened at almost the same time in December as log for j happened, oddly enough, in 2021. So we had about a year separation between solar winds, which was a software supply chain attack, into the solar winds asset. And then you had the vulnerability exposure in log for j which was a different kind of a situation, right? And so those two big events really were a catalyst to why governments have gotten a lot more involved in this topic. I would say solar winds was disruptive, but not in my mind as disruptive as, as log4j was given the prevalence of log4j everywhere. Now that's just my perspective because they're very different uh, attack vectors in terms of how they evolve, but they were both in, involving software. Luke? I, I have so many things, and I, I realize we're running out of time, so I'm, I'm sort of triaging in my mind what I want to ask. Uh, so I guess the first thing I want to say is it can seem really daunting. I'm imagining if, if you're a company, you're, you're fo especially with the challenges from COVID and supply chain and now uh, the disruptions that we're seeing from uh, the invasion of Ukraine, which it's it really goes to show how connected the world is too. Cause mm -hmm. I'm surprised, like just talk yesterday, I was talking with a, a developer who I had met at some of our IBM meetups years ago and his startup, his, uh, you know, lead developer was in Belarus and his team mm -hmm. was in Ukraine. And I mean, just the, the chaos that it, 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 you know, they survived all these supply chain issues and yeah. pivoted and figured out. And then now to be faced with this, and it, it really goes to show you how, how connected the world is. Uh, but what I wanted to parlay this to is that, you know, it seems daunting. It's very complex. You know, we mentioned all these attack vectors and across the hybrid landscape. Mm -hmm. But something I want to bring it back to is, you know, we, you know, we do, I think, great cybersecurity training for all of our employees at IBM. And I'm imagining a lot of our listeners do it at their company. But I, I feel like it seems like there's all this advanced stuff, but really, if you bring it back down to the basics, solidify yourself on the basics, right? Because so many attacks come from clicking that wrong uh, link yeah. in the email, or that that becomes the chink in the armor that brings them in. And the other thing I want to mention, and you know, I, I guess my question would be, is is this a good thing to say, or am I right here? But is also be really careful what you post. Uh, people post little mm -hmm. details about like. Oh, it's so annoying. We're getting an audit again like this, or yeah. oh, I don't like this thing. And you say it on Stack Overflow. And I was listening to uh, my, my favorite uh, cybersecurity podcast, uh, Darknet Diaries. And that's where penetration, penetra penetration testers go. Yeah. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, uh, these, uh, you know, yeah. nation states and, and organized yeah. crime, they're reading your Twitter, they're reading Stack Overflow. They're looking for those little pieces of information that give them the insight to start their social hack or to to know what tool set to use to attack you. So I guess my question is like, hey, basics, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And as as um, these kind of social tools have become more prevalent, even inside organizations where we're all using uh, things like Slack and GitHub and everything, I think you need to still discreetly define who your universe is. You don't need to share everything with everybody, particularly if you're in a large organization. You certainly don't need to share all of this information outside, right? It's not appropriate and it's going to create issues. And so basic education around cyber techniques, development techniques and everything need to be a critical part of everybody's journey. We were talking about that for organizations. Some of these things are very simple. I am a huge fan of LinkedIn, but I get a lot of LinkedIn messages coming to me and with lots of uh, links and I don't click, click on the links and I have to write people back and I'm, I'll, I'll say, if I'm interested, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get to me. Otherwise I'm not clicking on these links. You know what I mean? So we, we really do have to continue to educate everyone because it is very complex, but there's some basics. You can overshare, you can create too big of a team that you're working with. You don't need to share everything with everybody. It's just like, you know, my examples that I've talked about S bombs. Why should we share some of this stuff with everybody? Right. Um, but it, it, it does go back to education and skills. So I think that's something we can all do uh, for those of us who have very skilled teams. How can we help education? How can we create the next generation of cyber experts for organizations at large? Um, you know, it's actually exciting because there's a lot of opportunity for people here as well. Yeah, for sure. This is a, 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 a an amazing place to grow your skills. If, if this is, uh, you know, if you're working in the tech space, definitely focus on security. 
Um, our, I want to make sure that we we uh, you know we didn't miss anything, Jamie. Is there anything that that comes to mind that uh, we should have touched on uh, before we kind of have to wrap well, up? Well, I'm going to say one last thing because you know International Women's Day was earlier this week, and so in that vein, I'd just like to say that you know a lot of the topics we've been talking about are very interesting. You know whether it's uh, software delivery, software development, cybersecurity, security for organizations. So just put a plug out there for all the ladies that might be listening or people that uh, have ladies in their family or friends that, you know, this is a great opportunity for people from a career perspective. And we still don't see enough uh, women in technology and in some of these fields. So, you know, getting back to our point there about skills and everything, I, I'm just a real passionate uh, proponent of getting more women in, into these organizations uh, to increase uh, the folks that can, can help us, right? Uh, and to relay to everybody, uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> it can be fun and exciting, and you get to see a lot of of interesting things that are occurring in the world around you, and having have a big impact on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and to work with other great people. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll say on that. Uh, first of all, my team is hiring, so if anybody's out there, <laughs> uh, uh, but but additionally, you know, my Twitter DMs are open. If anybody uh, is watching now or watching later has more questions or wants to talk about any of these things or uh, you know wants to get into the space, uh, feel free to to reach out. I'm I'm happy to help and point people in the right direction. Um, yeah, and I don't I don't want to make you blush or anything, Jamie, but I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, uh, you know, when I would talk to people in the community after the White House meetings, they were effusive about how happy they were, ha how happy they were to have you in those meetings. Your uh, experience and intelligence is on display here. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming and talking with us. It's been really uh, informative and, and fascinating. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you're a great uh, host and it's a very important topic, something I'm very passionate about. So it was great to be here today and let's hope for warmer weather so we can get back to, 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 to golf and things like that. Yeah. Sounds good. And, and um, you know, if you ever want to come back on, something's happening, you want to talk about, uh, we, we'd love to have you back. I, I love that. Something's always happening. So it's <laughs> a matter of when you guys want to have me back, but I appreciate it. Thanks Luke. And thanks Joe. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Cheers. Cheers.